Good morning, everyone, and welcome. As we gather together in this place in the name of Jesus Christ for worship, we want to welcome everyone. Um, our plan today be just a little bit different. We're going to forego the normal opening of this service. We'll begin with prayer request and an opening prayer. And we'll try to uh, save some time then at the end of this service. Most of you got the message that Brother Cephas Norellis is desiring church membership here at Cornerstone. And so Brother Phil will be taking care of that at the conclusion of the message this morning. So we'll begin this with a prayer requests like we normally do. And we'll ask Brother Luke to have the prayer. So it's open if you want to share anything. Brother David. Brother Carlton Horst uh, told me last night that uh, he and Daniil are expecting a baby at any moment. And we just want to be in prayer as they await the birth of this new child. Mm -hmm. Carlton Horst and his family at Hart, Michigan, expecting a child very soon. Brother Phil? Conflicts all over the world, in Haiti and the Middle East, and even here, really. Okay, let's bow before him in a word of prayer. Lord, today we pray for 
the birth of this baby. It's a, uh, what a blessing it is to have children, to see life created, and to know that it only can come through you. Pray for God's blessing with our ties to be to that family. We pray for Israel. Just the struggles and the conflict, and Lord, we know that it's been going on for a long, long time, and that it will keep going on, but Lord, for safety, for people that are going to come to know you, for <coughs> people that do know you, and lives that can be changed to you, even while that's going on, pray as a country that we support Israel, that we stand behind your chosen people, even though we're different, but we know that you've called them to be yours. Pray for Haiti and just conflict there that seems to never end. For people that are risking their lives, for the people of that country who are standing up for you. Pray that you give them peace in their hearts and to know that they're doing the right thing to follow you even though they risk their lives. Pray for it in our own country, starting in our own homes, to just let us be the difference to our children, wives to their husbands, husbands to their wives, to be an example to set before that others can see that our lives are chasing after you and you're the reason for the hope that is in us. We're thankful for Jesus, our Savior, the death on the cross, and the home in heaven for each and every believer. Bless. 
Rise to all eternity. Do you know your eternal destiny? I ask that this morning because there could be someone in this congregation that really don't know where they're going. I would hope that if we truly do know where we're going, that that would drive our behavior and it would drive the direction that we step and we walk every day. It's literally impossible for a man to be going in this direction when his destiny is this way. Knowing your eternal destinies. The title of the message this morning, I invite you to open your Bibles, if you care to, to Luke chapter 16. Sixteenth chapter of Luke. Verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that, my, that he may dip the the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame but Abraham said son remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things but now he is comforted and thou art tormented and beside all this between us and you there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that may testify unto them, and they also come unto that they also come to this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they would repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, through, though one rose from the dead. 
Some call this a parable of Jesus. Some call it a, a real story that Jesus gives. He does use Abraham's name. No matter how you view that, a real story or a parable, Jesus gives that as a real teaching. There's many things that we can pick up from this account. Do you know your destiny this morning? This account describes two distinct places, a heaven and a hell. And so when we ask that question, when we give that title in the form of a question this morning, it's not really a multiple choice question. Do you know your destiny? Yes or no? There is two distinct places, a heaven and a hell. I have spoke about hell very few times publicly and I tremble every time I do. And really even when we speak about heaven I tremble. Some key takeaways in this passage here alone. I've already mentioned it gives us two distinct locations and two distinct judgments. There's clearly a heaven, there's clearly a hell. It also describes a great separation between the two. Here in King James, it calls it a gulf, a great gulf. It describes this heaven and this hell as, a very, as very literal places, not just a figment of our imagination. And that's why I think a message like this is important for all of us because, as I mentioned, there could be someone here who has not professed Jesus Christ as their Savior. And this message may speak to you in a different way than it does to someone who has named Christ. But many of us tend to push back this thought of our final destination. It is a very real place, and it is very real. Knowing your destination, your destiny. And I put the word no in there because many believers today, if you ask them if they really know where they're going to end up, they may shrug their shoulders and say, I don't know. I don't want to come across this morning in this message at all that I, that I know everything there is to know about our future destination. But the Bible has given us some very clear, distinct answers and insights and revelation to these two places. You can turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And th there's two verses here that is really the text this morning for this message. But I'll begin reading. I'll begin reading in verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, 
but in demonstration of the spirit of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among you that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that came to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God and a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, and which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Verse 9, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things which but the natural thing, man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ." Somewhat summarizing this, verse, verse 9 has always been a favorite verse of mine. And when you read that of itself, we get the idea that we really have no clue what God has prepared for us. And really this is an exact quote from the book of Isaiah where God gives Isaiah those words and he pens those words, but it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. And we can let our imaginations wander. In the book of Isaiah, God is telling Isaiah, in Old Testament terms, you cannot know. But it goes on here in the New Testament, because we have the Holy Spirit within us, it says, but God, verse 10, but God has revealed them to us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things Yea, the deep things of God. And it goes on and says, just like within our own created being, we, we don't know except the spirit within man. And it's making the comparison that we cannot know the things of God, we cannot know our future, we cannot know what He has prepared for us, except for that spirit of God that is in us, and also, in verse 16, because we have the mind of Christ. Now, this isn't some automatic thing. We have to search for Him. We have to seek Him. But I am of the belief this morning that if we really seek after the things of God, yea, the deep things of God, that God, by His Spirit, will reveal these things to us, and we can know our final destiny.
There's so much more that could be said on that. I encourage you when you put that verse 9 to memory and you love it with a passion like I have, that you will also include verse 10 because it doesn't stop there in verse 9. By His Spirit, He has revealed these things to us that we might know our final destiny. And in that last verse, it says, of which things we speak. And that tells us, like the Apostle Paul, that we need to be talking about these things because God has revealed them to us and we can encourage each other in these things. The book of Revelation, chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel in, unto the servant John, who bear record of his word, the word of God, and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep these things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. It tells me that the revelation, the book of Revelation, is really nothing more than the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it's the same concept. God has opened this up to us. It's not something that we should fear as we look into the future according to the word of God. God has revealed this to us through Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation is nothing more than the revealing of Jesus Christ. In fact, in my Bible, in the top here in my King James Version, it says the revelation of John. And I've struck that out with my ink pen. And I wrote in there the revelation of Jesus Christ according to John. This is not a book that reveals John. It is a book that reveals Jesus Christ. And it goes on and it says there in that same chapter, uh, John saw him standing. In verse 18 it says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Write these things which thou hast seen, past tense, which are present tense, and which things shall be hereafter future tense. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the book of Revelation reveals this to us. I'll say the whole New Testament. In fact, Jesus Christ himself came to reveal these things to us. Things of the past, things of our day, and things of the future. Why? It says there in verse 3, for the time is at hand. And I suppose that's above all what inspired this message this morning. I personally believe that the time is at hand. I don't know what all that means, but I know that we were, cl we're closer today than we were yesterday. The time is at hand, and I'm thinking that we should be looking at some of these things very, very seriously, and especially the title that's on the board this morning, Knowing Your Eternal Destiny. It is a question that only you can answer. You're not destined to end up somewhere just because Daddy went to church or just because Grandmother prayed. Well, there is an effect to that. Only you can answer that question of where you are going to end up. The time is at hand. John chapter 14. Familiar passage. Most of you could quote it. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. 
If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go, you know, and the way you know. Remember, I'm thinking about knowing your destiny. And you may question, how can I really know? Where I go, Jesus says, you know, and the way you know. And then Thomas speaks up and he says, Lord, we know not where you go and we know not the way. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And if you had known me, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. We know Jesus Christ. If we know Jesus Christ, we can know our destiny. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so I've drawn on the board here just a, a man on his journey. I want you to think of that stick man as you, or stick woman as you, on a journey. Where are you going? Where will you end up? One of two places, heaven or hell. Now Genesis talks and tells us about God created the heavens and the earth. And it goes on there. In chapter 2, and it tells us of the created man. Chapter 3 talks about the fall of man. And so God created man and set him on a course towards the eternal heavens, spending eternity with God forever. And then we know that man fell. Adam died. And so we'll just kind of draw a grave here. And because Adam died, the Bible says, it could give you go a lot of different scriptures, Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 5, because Adam died, we all are subject to death. We took upon ourself that sinful gene pool that leads to death. We are in Adam, the Bible says. And so we're all born in Adam's race, and we naturally will die, we spiritually will die. And all mankind, because of this fall, will be eternally separated from God. And so we know that that's why God sent His Son. The Bible speaks about hell and the different meanings of hell, and I've written some up here on the board. It speaks about different places, different realms possibly, different time periods what will happen in each of those places. And you know, just studying this out and bringing up some, some things online, it's rather interesting, the different concepts and the different uh, meanings that man kind of comes up with on his own. And I tried to keep this list short and just right out of the Bible. 
There's some lists. Some of the, the Catholics believe, I think, in the 12 different realms of hell. I found another list of seven different realms of hell. And of course, some of them would believe that you can go in to like the second layer and you can find fire that actually refines you and sends you back up to heaven. And I, I personally do not believe that for a minute. I believe that hell is a final destination, though the Bible does speak of different areas and different aspects and different, um, even different results or what takes place in those areas. For example, when David speaks of hell in Psalm 16.10, For thou shalt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Here we find the Hebrew word Sheol, and it just simply means the place of the dead, or a pit, or a grave. The Greek word here is Hades, so Hades and Sheol really is synonymous. One is a Greek word, one is the Hebrew word, the place of the dead. And so when Adam died a literal death, he went to Hades, or in Hebrew, Sheol. And when we die, the same for us, because we're in Adam and that natural death has been pronounced to all mankind. Hell is a place of the, for the dead bodies only. I'm going to make this real clear. It is a place for the body only. We know according to scripture the soul is eternal. The soul does not die. We used to sing an old hymn, for the soul of man never dies. Our souls are eternal. And so when we lay a loved one in the grave, that body is dead, as dead as dead can be. But that soul is not in the grave. That soul goes one place or the other. And that's why it's so important for us to answer that question before we die. Do you know your final destiny? I personally do not endorse the doctrine, I'll call it a false doctrine, of soul sleeping. Some would believe that the soul and the body is at rest, sleeping, unconscious. I believe the soul is very much at rest, at rest in Jesus, in paradise, with him, very much alive, and very much active. But the body is at rest in the grave, awaiting a resurrection. The soul of the righteous goes back to the God who created him. The Bible says, the, though the body becomes dust, the soul of the unrighteous goes on into another area of hell, and, and I don't know as far as the literal place, I'm not even going to describe that. Everything in the Bible would point to it being down or lower than, not upward. And everything in the Bible that speaks about heaven is of an, an upward ascent. So the unrighteous soul goes to a place called Tortaurus, which is the deepest of Hades. It's described as a place of torment, punishment, and pain. Now, I'm not trying to scare anyone here this morning, but if you haven't made Jesus Christ your Savior, this is where you're going. And I tremble to tell anyone that, but that's the scriptures. If you know him and you die in him, 
we have every promise and every hope with a surety that we can spend eternity with Him. But just as sure as that promise is true comes the promise that if we die without Him, our soul is going to Tartus, a place of torment. And in the chapter we read in Luke 16, I noticed just when I read it here at the pulpit this morning, that when the rich man was crying out and he said, I am, a, I am in a place of torments, and it was plural, and I hadn't picked that up before, tells me torments, pain. In one place it calls, it calls it outer darkness. I think in 2 Peter it's referred to as, as Jesus casting the angels into outer darkness. It's real. And it's a place of torment, punishment, and pain. And in Matthew, in three different chapters, three different places in the book of Matthew, it refers to this as outer darkness, weeping, gnashing of teeth, and separation. And so up until this point, the righteous and the unrighteous both are in hell, in Hades. Nothing more than the grave. But the unrighteous goes on into Tartarus. Torment and punishment. And then the third area that I wanted to touch on is Gehenna. And Jesus uses this many times, maybe not that exact word, but he speaks about the final place of hell, the final eternal lake of fire. In Matthew chapter 25, 12, we don't have time to go there, but he's speaking about those who claim to have known him and they come to him in that day and he has to turn them away and say, I don't know you. And they depart and go into this lake of fire. Depart from me into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And again, I want to emphasize this fire is not a refining fire. This fire is not a place where men and women who have rebelled against God goes to be refined and then ends up with Him in heaven. That is a false doctrine that's taught and of course it can easily be embraced. This is where we all were going. But we know that Jesus died on the cross and I want to just uh, quickly, we're running out of time, but I want to present three crosses and three graves. And I'm going to quickly call this the ABCs of life and death. The first one is this grave of Adam, A. A for Adam. We know that there was three thieves, or three crosses, I'm sorry, on Calvary that day. The cross of the thief who rebelled against God, and that's exactly where Adam was, that's exactly where we are in Adam without Christ. The cross of Adam, the grave of Adam, which I've already described, leads to hell and eternal death, and the, eventually the lake of fire. The second cross is B, for believer. It is the cross where the thief who believed was hanging on his one side and acknowledged him in faith, and Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. And that is, that is the grave that every one of us as believers, when we die in Christ, 
we die in that grave. And our soul goes with him to paradise. And the third one, of course, is C for Christ. The cross of Christ. This is why he came. And I wanted really bad to go to Isaiah 53. I won't go there. But it tells about Jesus. Because we went astray. Jesus died. And he suffered. And he had uh, pain. And he bore our pain, our suffering, our shame. And I don't know exactly where Jesus went. After he died, some believe that he went actually literally into hell and to pay that price for us. Some believe that he could not enter into hell because he was only righteous. All I know is he took upon himself our sin. And I think there in Isaiah 53 it talks about uh, him bearing our iniquity. I don't know if he actually went there or not, but I do know that somewhere, somehow, some way, he robbed the keys of hell from Satan. Jesus says that he has the keys of hell. He also told Peter, I believe, that he has the keys to the kingdom. And so the sum, summary of all of that is Jesus Christ is the key. He has the keys of hell. He has the keys of heaven. And he is your key to your eternal destiny. Because he died on the cross. And when we die in Christ, we can go to heaven with him. And I've listed the different realms of heaven. And we don't have time to get into all of that. The first, the first one, quickly, is simply our atmosphere, what we see. And if, if you've experienced what I have this last week or two, it almost seems like heaven here. It's so beautiful. But I don't have to tell you this earth is not heaven. But that the Bible does call this atmosphere heaven. We, we even speak about the birds flying in the heavens, speaking of our atmosphere. One writer said, if earth was a grape, then our atmosphere would be the skin of that grape. So that first heaven is really not very thick. It's not, it's not really a large realm, though it looks big to us from here, from our earthly view. And the next realm of heaven is the, uh, the universe, the created known universe. And really there's no boundaries there. And the Bible also speaks about, in Psalm 19, it calls it the heavens, where the sun comes out of its chamber and comes over, dec declares the glory of God. It speaks about the stars and the, and the created universe, the heavens. And then the third heaven that's referred to in Scripture, we find when the Apostle Paul was actually caught up into the third heaven. I don't know what that would have been like. He don't know how to describe it himself. He says his words are unspeakable. He doesn't know how to describe this paradise of God, the third heaven. And again, I, I personally believe that when the believer dies, that his soul goes to paradise to be with God, alive and well. And then the fourth Heaven is described in Scripture as the eternal heaven. And so it's kind of hard for us to get our minds around one heaven or four heavens. When we die and go to paradise with God, it, it may just blend right on into eternity and into the eternal heavens. I don't know just how that's going to be, but I do know that it's a real place. In Revelation chapter 20, it talks about this place. And in Revelation chapter 21, it talks about the heaven being a city, which I personally think it's describing it as people. When we, when we think about Sodom and Gomorrah being dest destroyed in the Old Testament, it was really talking about the people being destroyed, and of course the city was as well. And in 
Revelation chapter 21, and it's talking about the city coming down, the people of God coming down out of heaven. And this is a, an eternal place, and it's a real place, a literal place, I believe. And it's a place where we who, who have died with Christ, because he died, went to the grave, paid that price, that penalty, bore our pain, went wherever he had to go to keep me from going there. We can now be in eternity with him. And eventually, in that eternal heaven, that realm of glory, the dwelling place of God, where we can spend forever with him. <clears throat> what are you going to do, my friend? Someday your life will end. When in the grave you lie, will you then wonder why you passed Jesus by? Eternity is made of a choice of two, a lake of hot fire, or a home beyond the blue. Jesus loved the sinner and he didn't care who. He died on the cross to make us brand new. What are you going to do, my friend? Someday your life will end. When in the grave you lie, will you then wonder why you passed Jesus by? Let's have a song. Just as I am without one
message has resounded in your heart, say with me, say amen. 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 What a powerful, powerful testimony to our eternal destiny, and it's all anchored in Jesus. We had the privilege last night to uh, pay uh, an official visit, I guess you call it. I don't know. We visited with. <laughs> With Cephas last night because he's requested uh, membership. Many of you, like me, have known Cephas for a number of years, and he has a very powerful, God given message to many, many people that we would not normally reach. He goes into not only his home country of Haiti, but there's a number of Haitian. Uh, people that are in the United States and they have communities and he has been given the privilege to bear testimony and to preach in many of theirs to many of their churches in the United States and still is and some of the other little churches in Columbus where he lives. He's been a great missionary for the gospel of Jesus. We have encouraged him to keep that. We do not want him to change what the Lord has called him to do and he's called to the ministry in his home country where he comes from and so we ha- I want you to understand that and believe it he was baptized what 28 29 years ago um, but he was once backwards he said uh, in Haiti and so he's been a faithful follower of the Lord many many years but he requested this March when we were in Israel together he requested uh, that he be baptized Uh, with the method that we use and he understands that the method is not salvation but he felt like he wanted to give a fresh testimony to his commitment to his Lord and so I just want to show you a picture of that I think they're ready that is it Brian Stahl in the middle, Cephas on the right, and I'm there on the left. This was at the Jordan River. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. So, let's see if I have requested a membership here at Cornerstone. Uh, we've had a number of talks, and I think. He has a very clear understanding of our understanding of Scripture. He also understands that his membership here is not his salvation, but he desires to be a part of the work that is going on here and to be part of this body for which we are appreciative. So we're going to go through the passage we always read at this time, Matthew 18. 
and we're going to um, share some thoughts with that as we go through it. And I know you're all familiar, but I encourage you to turn your Bibles to Matthew 18, verse 10. We'll start there. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. There's been some debate of who the little ones are. I personally think we're all the little ones. None of us are mature. None of us are that sharp, that wisdom. But it says something very, very special to a believer. He has, we have an angel somehow. And I don't fully understand this, but there is an angel that represents every believer. What a beautiful, beautiful thing is here. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. That's all the little ones. That's you and me. How think ye if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So if a natural man that has livestock loses one animal, he goes looking for it. How much more the heavenly father that is assigned an angel that died for us goes looking for the sons and daughters of men. What an unbelievable thing. And we've just heard that in this message today. That Jesus went looking for us and it started at the cross for us. Fifteenth verse. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone, and he shall hear thee, and if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. We really don't know how often this is used, because we shouldn't. My prayer is, and this is not an easy thing, this is hard. And, but my prayer is that this would be used by everyone who names the name of Jesus and they would seek their brother, their sister. When conflict comes for peace, for unity, for reconciliation, for the honor of God. And Cephas, I know that you have served him many years, but are you willing to continue to do this? I know you are. Thank you. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses Every word should be established. And this is, again, we don't necessarily know how often this is used because if it's two or three people, believers, men or women that are believers, and we take them with us to work it out with this individual, um, they're not going to talk either if they're godly people. So we don't know how often this is used. But it's a system that God built into the body of Christ to try to keep peace and unity and to bring glory to him. I know you're willing to do this. You are. If he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. And I just want to remind all of us, and I know Cephas, you understand this. We've talked about it. That to hold someone as a heathen man, as a publican, means that they are someone that you desire to be fully converted. It does not mean that we reject them in the sense that we do not like them or don't want to have anything to do with them. It's done in the sense that we want them to come to the full knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so at this point, it does become public. Historically, sometimes when these things have become public, they become ugly. I don't think that's the spirit here. The spirit here is to win souls to Christ. You're willing to do that. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask, and it shall be done of them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. <laughs> I don't know if this is an extension of the three steps we've just gone through. It almost seems like it. But I think our Father, our Heavenly Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, knows our heart 
when we attempt, by his grace, for reconciliation and love between brothers. And he's saying that when it is finally agreed on and we come together and we love each other, even if we agree to disagree in some areas, but we do it because we love the Lord and we love one another, he hears that and it becomes a binding thing. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him till seven times. And Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. And I think about this. We say we have forgiven. And I'm maybe talking about myself and all of you listening this morning can, can pass judgment. But it's easy to forgive in one sense harder to reconcile but I don't think Peter is saying you know I forgive 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 and then I even though I forgive I turn around and repeat it every chance I get and a lot of times those things are so damaging so the cry here is to not only be reconciled with people and by the way I think this is a pattern for living that is not just within in this case Cornerstone but even the Christian world even even the world at large, the people have to know that we value them more than even their sin. And it's just, a, it's a very powerful thing. This, this section of scripture, my opinion is that when the millennial reign comes and our Lord reigns, we're really going to see this work. And we will give him the glory. Are you willing to live this way? I know you are. Thank you. There's one more. Um, I want, and I always do, this is just my own personal preference. It's in Romans 12, the ninth verse. Let love be without dissimulation. In other words, that means don't be a hypocrite. Act like you're a great Christian lover and you're not at all. We're not to do that. But this is what it says. Abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. It's a very, very simple thing to actually, that there's something in our spirit that when something is evil, and sometimes we really don't know if it's evil or not. We, we just don't know. We're a little bit confused or not clear. And it says, stay away from it. Abhor it. In other words, we stay away from it until God makes it clear. And when we see something that is good, that is lovely, that is kind, that is godly, we cleave to it with everything we have, even if it costs us. I know you live this also. I think, uh, I think I'd like to give you the opportunity right now if you care to, to bear testimony or share anything that's on your heart. <laughs> he looks at the clock. <laughs> I'll be as short as possible. And uh, I'm just excited I uh, I have been coming here to Cornerstone for about eight years you will see like eight years with all the time I've been coming but this morning was a different Sunday it was the most excitement Sunday when I'm coming to join the church and to present before you as a part as a member of the congregation. I feel like my soul is rejoicing with you. And uh, I want to thank God for Jesus Christ, like the message was preaching. Because if it wasn't for Jesus, I wouldn't know you, and you wouldn't know me. But he shed his blood on the cross to cleanse us, purify us, like the message was preaching, to set us in the same pathway on our way to destiny, eternal destiny, which is eternal life. As brothers and sisters, with the love of Christ in our heart, here in Cornerstone, and he, he just inspired me to keep coming to Cornerstone after I came here the first time. And we have, me and my wife, been so several churches. But telling the truth, I was not impressed. 
It is the truth, no offense for other places, but cornerstone impressed by the love, smiling when people come in. I didn't know nobody in the church. She did. She remember Phil and other people. I didn't know no one. But I feel like I was knowing these people for so many years the first day I came. And there they pop like two. They have good chicken, good food. I jump in and eat. And then I was like, man, feel like I know these people for a long time, smiling with me. And then I enjoy, I had some good chicken. Why, right, baby? I ate good. We were rejoicing in church. And we go, I said, I shall return. I shall return. My wife said, yes, we're coming back again. And there I am today. God made a way, and he blessed me to be a part of the church. We are already in the body of Christ, but on earth, we're still working like the message to our destiny together. Thank you for accepting my membership. Thank you for your love towards me and my family and my country as well. Thank you for all that you guys have done. Some of you are really special. You are all special, but there are others that go a little bit deeper. Reach out and be a mother to me and be a father to me. I can't reward any one of you for what you have done, but I know Jesus on the last day has a reward in his hand and he will reward each one of you. Thank you so much for loving me and I love you too. And we're gonna stay together in one accord and one spirit. We will work for the kingdom of God. I know the time is worth out there. Like the Sunday school said, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We are more than conqueror, and this world will have tribulation, but we are courageous. We, our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, overcome the world. Keep praying for me, and I will be praying for you. I'm here to serve. I'm here to work. I'm not joining the church for any up or, or other things like leadership. Put. No, I just joined the church because I love the church. And the church loved me too. And Jesus loved me. We're going to keep that love going on. And I'm going to stay me. Like I, one of my brothers said to me last night, just be Cephas. I will be Cephas among you. And I will always be Cephas. And I will go to the heaven with Cephas. And the church cornerstone will still be cornerstone. And we will be go together, together in the heaven. Thank you for everything again.